Alan, Alan, can you hear me? I can hear you. I didn't hear Abir, but I heard. I can hear you now. I, I didn't hear Abir also. I guess no, Abir... she she was she was muted. Oh, okay. Sorry, so... we're, we're we're gonna start. Okay, let's start. Okay, hello and welcome to everyone. My name is Abir, and I am an intern at Africa for Palestine. Welcome to today's conversation a biblical response to Chief Judge Mukhaim with Reverend and Professor Alan Busak, which will be hosted by our very own board member, Professor Fareed Isak. Before we start, a little bit about our organization. For those of you who are not familiar with us, we focus on strengthening African-Palestinian relations and pushing back against apartheid Israel's infiltration and influence onto the continent of Africa. We work with solidarity groups, trade unions, political formations, and human rights organizations across the African continent who have our same spirit of progressive internationalism and commitment to standing with the oppressed peoples of the world. This is part of a series of online webinars that we host throughout the week on topics of political education. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Professor Fareed Asak, who will introduce Professor Busak. Uh, good evening, Dumelang, uh, Sambonane, Huyanant, Assalamu Alaikum, Shalom to all our viewers uh, in South Africa, and good afternoon or good night or whatever it is in any <clears throat> other part of the world. Um, as Abir said, my name is uh, Farid Asak, and uh, uh, other than being a board member, I'm a professor at the University of Johannesburg. Uh, and uh, I'll be uh, hosting tonight's discussion with uh, Professor uh, Alan Busak, um, who is uh, a very well-known uh, and distinguished figure uh, in uh, South Africa. Um, Dr. Busak was one of the leaders of our country's uh, liberation struggle was a, um, was a co-founder of the United Democratic Front. In fact, um, he was the first one to publicly call for the formation of such a front. And anybody who's familiar with uh, the history of our liberation struggle, especially uh, in the 1970s and 80s, will know what a formidable role the UDF played um, in our country's uh, liberation struggle. And it is deeply etched uh, in the memories of um, our people. Uh, indeed, uh, there is much nostalgia for the days of uh, the UDF. But other than being a uh, formidable figure in our country's liberation struggle, uh, Dr. Alan Busak is also a professor of uh, uh, with a significant uh, international standing. Um, <clears throat> he's the former moderator of the World Alliance of Reformed Churches, uh, and in his capacity as an international church leader, um, he was one of those who, who led the struggle to ensure that the then, uh, what we described as the apartheid government uh, at worship, the then white Dutch reformed church um, that was a major vehicle, an ally, a source of strength to the apartheid regime, that that church was thrown out of um, the international community of uh, reformed churches. So Dr. Busak was very much in the forefront of that battle. Um, other landmarks in the history of the, not only the South African uh, reformed tradition, but the international uh, reformed community. Um, the confession of Balha, um, Dr. Alan Busak was at the forefront of that, and that has become a part of the uh, catechism or a part of the belief of the reformed community, the confession of Belha, and also, of course, uh, one of the most important documents uh, in the reformed tradition today is the Kairos document. Um, and in that document also, uh, that for the first time, very, very succinctly, 
depicted the difference between uh, status quo theology, um, accommodation theology, and a theology that speaks to uh, the needs of the oppressed and their liberation. So the Kairos document became a very, very famous document internationally in the church in the reform community. Um, and uh, later on, of course, the Palestinians um, also developed, based on that, also developed um, its own uh, Palestine Kairos document and a number of other churches in different parts of the world uh, have the, in the United States, they have developed a Kairos document. In Germany, they have form one. And Dr. Busak has been at the heart of the birth of all of these initiatives, um, arguably the father of liberation theology in uh, South Africa. So um, <clears throat> it's very, very good to have you here, Ellen. You are a friend, you are a comrade of many, many years. We have been through thick and thin together. We have been yeah. in prison cells together. Um, yeah, anyway, let me not reminisce about the first time that I heard <laughs> you, but it was in the Apostolic Church, Apostolic Faith Mission Church, a bit unusual in Bonteville. I had just returned from Pakistan as a young Muslim third theologian myself, and I heard you preaching and I thought, gosh, this man is speaking from the depths of my own soul and the depths of my own heart. So here you are with us tonight, uh, Alan, um, talking to us about uh, Chief Justice Mohueng Mohueng, who um, in the recent past has, um, uh, what he says in his personal capacity, has spoken very uh, kindly um, or praising the current state of Israel um, and confusing that with the biblical state of Israel, but not only that, uh, declared it um, a Christian duty to support the state of Israel. He went even beyond that and criticized the South African government's um, uh, coldness towards uh, the state of Israel. Um, yeah, and it really went for the South African government. So of course, he's a South African citizen, so he has the freedom of speech, and at the same time, uh, he's the chief justice of the country, and certain obligations come with that. But Ellen, this man speaks from a passionate position of being a biblical, believing Christian. So here we have you also, um, a biblical believing Christian, and your views are very much at variance uh, with, uh, with Justice Mohoeng Mohoeng. Uh, to what do you attribute this difference that here you are, um, a friend of the Palestinian, a friend of the oppressed, um, and so outraged by the comments that the Chief Justice made? Well, thank you, Farid, and good evening to you and to Abir and everyone connected to us tonight via this conversation. It is a great uh, privilege, but also a great joy uh, to be with my friend and comrade of so many, many years, and with all of you um, knowing our heartbeat for justice and freedom and equality and liberation for all God's children. And tonight we are talking especially of the situation of the Palestinian people. So thank you for this opportunity. Yes, it is a, 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 a very different way of being a follower of Jesus Christ that we are talking about tonight for it. And it is a way of understanding how one reads and understands, interprets and preaches the Bible, the judge, um, is very proud of the fact that he is not only a judge, he is also a pastor of uh, Winners Chapel International Church. Um, the thing, of course, is that there is a vast difference between the way fundamentalist, so-called charismatic, sometimes called New Pentecostalist churches with their um, vast impact um, in our communities, and they in turn 
have been fundamentally impacted by American imperialist ideological religion um, that we see at work every day from the supporting of the wars that the United States uh, find itself in against um, seven countries at the moment to the exclusion of whole groups of people in the population um, to what they call dominion theology, in which they say that Christians are really the only inheritors of power from God. And therefore, wherever Christians are, we must work towards taking power in government and everybody else, the Muslims and the Hindus and those who do not believe they are heretics, they are uh, apostates, they have no say in government and wherever we can, we must make the Bible the constitution of the country. Now, if you come from that kind of background and you come to us, I would say the way I read the Bible, that's not at all how I see it. He, for me, I mean, from the very beginning that I began to realize the connection between the oppression of black people in South Africa and the role of the white Dutch reformed church and how they have used, abused and interpreted wrongly the Bible to give justification to the oppression that apartheid brought to the millions of our people in South Africa. I realized here is a total case of how we read the Bible, how we understand the God of the Bible. For me, the God of the Bible is the God who first sort of expressed God's self in the choice for a slave people, in the choice for liberation, for justice. And you mentioned the Belhar Confession. And the thing about the, Kolhar, the Belhar Confession is that it confesses God as a God of radical, inclusive, indivisible justice, radical, in, uh, uh, indivisible equality, and a God of radical, indivisible inclusion. And so that God is the God that I see in the Bible. And that is the God that Jesus of Nazareth brings forth uh, when he comes to say, and the first thing that Jesus says is, I have come, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. That's in the gospel of Luke chapter four. The first time Jesus ever speaks in public, um, according to Luke. And he says, the gospel, the, the gospel tells me that the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And God has sent me to bring good news to the poor, to free the captives, to bring liberation to the oppressed, to heal the brokenhearted, and, and, and to bring about the Sabbath year of the Lord. In other words, that year in which all debt is forgiven, in which the land that people have stolen or taken should be given back to those families who have now been impoverished, that every form of slavery should be abolished, every form of serfdom should be abolished. It is a call for a radical equality that Jesus says, this is what I have come to do. Now, this Jesus cannot be the Jesus, I believe, that Justice Mohen talks about. You read the Bible and, and I, I see him like all these people who say we are Bible believing Christians, but they are not Bible believing Christians, they are selective Bible believing Christians. There are portions of the Bible that they take for themselves and other portions of the Bible that they in the same passage, for instance, we, we, we know that and he never mentions this, the judge, this, in his response to what uh, Africa for Palestine have written and to what other people have asked him to explain. He never says this explicitly, but in his very first declaration before the Judicial Commission, he says that I am a Bible believing Christian. I believe every single word the Bible says, and that is how I will base my life on. Now, the Bible tells us in the book of Joshua, especially chapter six, about the conquest of Palestine according to the promise of God and by the command of God. Um, and that is what he is now referring to. He says, God promised the land of Canaan, 
which is the land of Palestine, to the Jews. And so whatever they do is okay because that is what God had promised them. It's the same thing that whatever they did according to the book of Joshua is okay because that's what God has promised them. But now let me say, in that book of Joshua, the description that we get from the conquest of Palestine is that God gives Joshua the command, go in there and you smite the whole city with your anger. You conquer, you take, you kill every man, woman, and child. You, 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 you put them to the edge of the sword, the Bible says. Now, in my book, I refer to that. And I refer also to how Zionists today draw the conclusion for what, what Israel is doing in its occupation of Palestine, in its murderous policies, in its oppression of people, in its genocide of the Palestinian people, that that is all now according to the will of God. So there is a, a Jewish uh, a, a journalist who wrote this about this move that is now happening as we speak. He says, the bleeding edge among Israeli politicians, and he mentions the name of Minister of Education, M.K. Smotrich, and the Jerusalem Mayor Barkat and their ilk, he says, are nowadays advocating the move into the so-called decisive stage of Israeli-Palestinian conflict to transgress from the status quo into what they call a durable peace, a final solution for the Palestinian question. Now he goes on and he says that vision, according to Mr. Smotrich, is taken from the book of Joshua, where the invading Israelites and act a genocide on the native Canaanites until not a single soul is left to breathe, to paraphrase Rabbi Maimonides. And then he says, so he quotes Joshua, or I quote Joshua uh, uh, 6 verse 21, and they burned down the city and everything in it, only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze have they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord, and then he repeats that in verse 24. And then this journalist ends with saying this, from the foot soldiers to the big brass, from the flag waving street folk to the height of academia, Israel is ideologically prepared to enact a Palestine Shua. Now, you cannot talk about Palestine and Israel without being honest enough to mention that this is what you base your belief on. If this is what you believe as a Bible believing Christian, then you should say so. He doesn't say so anywhere. And now he says, I never said anything. I'm only, I love all Palestinians. I hate that phrase. That he said, oh, I love Palestinians, but in the meantime, I support the Zionists in what they are doing. I love Palestinians as Jesus has commanded me to do. But in the meantime, I criticize our government for its support of Palestine in their struggle for freedom and humanity. And he quotes Mandela, that we must love everybody, so we must love everybody in Israel. But, but he forgets to say that Mandela was very clear from the very beginning that we stand by Palestine for all sorts of reasons, not least for the reason of our own humanity that is linked to their humanity and to their struggle. And so there is a, that dishonesty is not Christian. That victimhood in which he cleaves, closes himself is not Christian. From almost the very first paragraph to right through his document, he says, I am the target. People hate me, people will kill me and they can kill me and I will forgive them. I mean, what Christian talks like that? I know of nobody who wants to kill him. I know of him supporting Netanyahu and the Israeli government and the SADF killing Palestinian babies. And he says nothing. Snipers taking aim at children, 
taking aim at people in wheelchairs, taking aim at nurses who like to help those who have been shot at by the Israeli army. And he says nothing about, is that where Christians stand? Jesus will not be there, that I can tell you. The Jesus the Bible tells us about is squarely against that view. And I just hope that Judge Mohueng, <clears throat> when he so passionately defends Israel without any kind of compassion for the oppression and the genocide of the Palestinians is not a follower of Jesus. He may be a follower of a Jesus in his mind or what his American friends tell him or what the Jerusalem Post allows him to write, but he's not a follower of Jesus of Nazareth. I cannot see that and I cannot defend that stance. Ellen, Ellen I want to unpack uh, a little thing with you. So one of the first texts that you uh, mm -hmm. refer to right in the beginning uh, speaks about the mission of Christ to yes. the poor. Okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> uh, Christ declares is is the, the primary or the first part of his mission to the poor. Yes. This, of course, I mean, doesn't mean that he doesn't have <laughs> a mission to the whole of humankind or to no, no, all no. other people. Okay. So, um, so Mohen prefaces, as you so well pointed out, um, his support for the Israeli regime and the government and criticizes that. Okay, all of that. But he also slips in. <clears throat> I love the Palestinians. So <laughs> now you're sitting very much with, um, and I here refer to particularly the situation in the USA, but I want you to use that and extend the logic that we see here, where <clears throat> people say black lives matter. Um, so Christ comes along and says, my mission is to the poor. And then you have other people coming along and says, why are you singling out the poor? Christ's mission was to everybody. Um, <clears throat> so as soon as you talk about the Palestinians, people say, wait, we want peace for Arabs and Jews. They reduce it to Arabs and Jews. Why are you talking about the Palestinians? Black lives matter. Why are you talking about Black Lives Matter? All lives matter. And yeah. so how do you see this mushiness when the reduction or when the claim of Black Lives Matter is reduced to a, because as soon as you say all lives matter, it really means that you don't have to take a stand against racism. You don't That's have right. to commit yourself to anything because right. the thing about all lives mattering, it is just so big that you can't start unraveling anywhere. So where do you see this kind of logic of all lives matter um, in the United States, uh, very much spearheaded in the United States um, by uh, the white Christian right? How do you see this corresponding to Mohoeng's logic? of um, I love all Palestinians and I love the Israelis? Well, the problem is uh, manifold, but let me just take a, a few things. When uh, they say, and you can read Mokhwenge, he quotes that thing, that, that phrase from what he has written three or four times in his piece in his response to the Judicial Commission against Africa for Palestine. And, and, and he says, I love the Palestinians and I love the Jews and I love. In the Bible, the love that Jesus professes for humanity, like the love that God professes right through the Hebrew Bible, through the, through the biblical prophets, is never a love divorced from justice. It is always a love rooted in justice. If God says, if you want to know me at all, he says in the book of Jeremiah, he says Jeremiah to King Jehoiakim, to love me, to know me is to do justice. If you don't do justice, you cannot love me and you cannot know me. 
You don't even know who I am. So you cannot profess, oh, I love all Palestinians. Reduce the word of God and the, and, and the love of Jesus to some sentimental nothingness. And then you divorce Jesus from his life of justice and his life of being clear on his mission from God. That's number one. So it's a, it's a false love. It's a sentimental love. It does the Bible no honor and it does Jesus no honor. Number two, they always say, oh, all lives matter because Jesus worried about all people. Well, of course, Jesus worried about all people, but note in the Bible, the way Jesus speaks of the poor is a very different way in which Jesus speaks of the rich and the powerful and the privileged. Jesus' relationship with poor, occupied Galileans, Palestinians, that's the ancient land of Palestine. Let's never forget that. And there are white people, and I'm sure the judge will be as angry when we refer to Jesus as an occupied Palestinian who rose up in anger against the oppression of his people and the oppression of all people. And the way Jesus speaks in, uh, for instance, the Sermon on the Mount to that group of poor Palestinians sitting there is a different way in which Jesus speaks to the elites and the powerful of Jerusalem who participated with the Romans in the oppression and the exploitation of their own people. So they were the sellouts of their day. Now, that's num point number two. So if you look at the way Jesus speaks to the poor and the powerless and the oppressed in the Bible, and you look at a chapter, say, of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23, where Jesus is outraged against the powerful who exploit the people, who lie to the people, who steal their goods and steal their land. He called those people and then they come, oh, but I belong to God. He said, you are hypocrites. You are like white painted sepulchers. You are graves. Outside you are beautiful and painted white. Inside you are full of rotting bones. That's Jesus. He says, you are a bunch of snakes. That's Jesus speaking, not me. That's Jesus. And Jesus says, you are the blind leading the blind. And so when I hear Mukhwen, I think, yeah, well, there you go. That's the blind trying to lead the blind. And you all go down over the cliff together because of this false theological claim on Jesus. And so Jesus cannot be claimed for all lives matter. Jesus is not on the side of the policemen who kill black people, unarmed black people. Jesus is not on the side of the attorney generals and the laws who protect those policemen. Jesus is not on the side of the judges in the courts who cannot ever find these people guilty. Jesus is not on the side of politicians who justify and legitimize and waffle when it comes to these things. Jesus claims us to be not neutral, but to stand where God always stands, which is on the side of the poor and the oppressed and the despised and the sat upon and the spat upon and the genocided of the world. If Jesus were in Palestine today, Jesus would not say all lives matter. So Netanyahu, my child, I love you. Go on doing what you're doing. No, no, no. Jesus will say, I am in the midst of, I stand. Where do you find me? In Gaza. Where do you find me? In the occupied territories. Where do you find me? You will find me where the babies are dying of hunger. You will find me in the line where the mothers wait who have to go to hospital and give birth in the line because the soldiers won't let them through to those hospitals. Where do you think God is and what does Mukhwen think of his God to take that God? and make it the God of Jesus Christ. And so, no, God is not a God of all lives matter. From the word go to the very last page, the Bible is very clear. If you want to look for God, you look for God where, as my mother used to say, the plagues fall. 
where the, where the rich and the powerful and the strong and the exploitative, where they come down hard on the lives of the defenseless and the despised. That's where you will find God. And, and, and that's the difficulty with the Bible. So Jesus cannot be sentimentalized. Jesus cannot be tamed. Jesus cannot be domesticated. Jesus cannot be depoliticized. Jesus cannot be taken from where he comes from, a poor child uh, born to a young woman from a poor family in occupied Galilee who couldn't even read or write properly. That's our Jesus. He's not on the side of the powerful. And, and, and I'm afraid that that will be the clash. I've always said, just as apartheid had become in the 1970s, but especially in the 1980s, and you will know this very well, uh, uh, Farid, as will the other comrades who are listening tonight, just as apartheid became internationally the standard in which the litmus test, so to speak, for your political integrity and for your faith, um, not relevance, your faith integrity, authenticity, that was the test. Where do you stand in the apartheid situation? That situation today is the Palestinian situation. And the Christian's faithfulness to God and the Christian's integrity of their faith is tested by where we stand on the Palestinian issue. That to me is the litmus test. And it is because all of the other situations of oppression and exploitation and genocide come into focus when we put it all, and what it really means when we put it all within the context of what has been happening to Palestinians for almost 80 years now. And if 80 years is not enough to make you understand that you have a choice to make here, and if murdering babies is not enough to make you understand where God stands and where Jesus will be, then I don't know what is. But your claim on Jesus is in vain. Uh, Ellen, you know, of course, uh, I agree with you. But one of the difficulties, Ellen, that we have is that um, <clears throat> I'm not sure what was the word that Hillary Clinton used um, for to describe during the previous elections to describe uh, Trump's supporters. Deplorables. But the what? Deplorables. The, the deplor deplorables. Yeah. Right, right, the deplorables, right. But the truth is, Ellen, <clears throat> that at the heart of uh, the base of many of the people who espouse this kind of theology that uh, Mohoeng Mohoeng is uh, espousing, um, they are quote unquote, and I'm not using the word unkindly, they are in many ways the losers. Yeah. If you look at, um, well, some people would describe them again unkindly as white trash for example, in the United States. But the truth is that there is a, that there is a group, a, 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 a constituency of people who are uneducated largely, who are illiterate uh, largely, and um, <clears throat> the people with this right-wing uh, prosperity gospel, uh, the, <clears throat> the quote-unquote biblicists, um, who get sold all this uh, right-wing stuff um, about, uh, about Zionism and um, that many of them, they do come from poorer communities. Um, uh, and not all, I mean, of course, uh, most of the time, uh, the leaders of these churches are exceptionally wealthy. Uh, the Jerry Falwells and uh, let's not go there now, um, but many of these, uh, many of these uh, prosperity gospel, lead the leaders are very, very wealthy. So if you look at Mohoeng Mohoeng's church, 
I'm quite sure that many of his, uh, the ordinary folks in, who ascribe to that theology, that they often come from poorer backgrounds. So what makes that community so much more susceptible to this kind of theology rather than the kind of liberationist approach that we are talking about? Why do they not welcome the Christ of the poor? Um, and uh, there's also a, a Muslim text, by the way, where the Prophet Muhammad is reported to have said, uh, oh God, let me live amongst the poor. Let me die amongst the poor. On the day of judgment, raise me amongst the poor. But this theology of get rich, this yeah. theology is the theology that often appeals to the poor. So yeah. how do we explain the fact that this man can say, what are you talking about the poor? Most of the people who come and listen to me preach on a Sunday, they are the poor. Yeah. Well, let me say this, as a, just as a side remark, don't forget that 81% of white evangelicals in the United States voted for Trump in the 2016 election. And, and, and white evangelicals are not only the poor, they are middle-class people, uh, they are very, very conservative, and some of them, of, and the billionaires, of course, vote for him because every policy that he enacts is to the benefit of the billionaires, but that's one thing. But there is a reason why, especially in Africa, but also in the United States, uh, poor people are almost always, and that's one of the curses of poverty, poor people are almost always without options. It's like slavery. And poor people are almost always on the edge of desperation. Um, and so the poor are the ones who have a job today, but don't know whether they will have that job tomorrow. There's a reason why we speak of the poor and then we speak of the working poor. And so the work in this country, the working poor are those who have a job, don't get paid enough, must still come home and share their meager salaries and what they earn with the poor who live in their house and are part of their extended family. So it's cycles of impoverishment, it's cycles of deep desperation. And what these churches with their prosperity gospel have done and they have been and still are very good at it. They have studied the situation. And so they tell people that if you come to me and if you believe what I say, blessings from God will come upon you. And the more you give out of your poverty, you more you, you will give yourself out of your poverty because the more you give to the church, in the prosperity gospel language, you give to me the pastor because I am in the end the, the one who receives all the money and I decide what happens to it because I am what they call the set man of God. I am the only mediator between you and God. You can't pray for yourself. The pastor must pray on your behalf. The pastor must pray that you get a job. The pastor must pray that in your job, you get a promotion. The pastor must pray for your new car. The pastor must pray for your new house. And then you, if you give according to to the desire of your heart. I'm quoting now for my friends in these churches. If you give according to the desire of your heart to the church, God will give in turn according to the desire of your heart. So I have a, a friend in one of these large churches in Johannesburg, maybe 3,000 members. And I was standing next to him one Sunday morning. And, and there was a, a guy who came to him and said, Pastor, um, you prayed for me the last time. And now I have my job. I just want to bless you. Bless means I'm giving you money. So he opens the envelope in front of me and he sees 10,000 rand. And he looks to this guy and he says to him, if you really believe that God has blessed me, has blessed you through me, bless me with something that makes a difference. Don't bless me with what I already have. 
Meaning, if you come back next time, don't come back with 10,000 Rand. Come back with 20 or come back with 25. I mean, and, and just like that, I mean, he wasn't even worried about me standing next to him hearing this exchange. But if you, if you are told that this is the only way you will get out of your poverty, and you know, and they tell you government won't help you, and the, and the government don't give you a job, doesn't give you a job, and your pension is being stolen by corrupt officials um, uh, in, in the pension office or whatever it is they call it these days, and you go to the church because our people, and that's another thing, our people are a religious people, Farid. We, we really do believe with all our hearts that God not only exists, but that God will hear my prayer and that God will be faithful and God will give me a promise and God will hold to that promise. And, and, and if, if I as a pastor and I have, and I'm clever enough and I know how to exploit that need and that desperation, I draw these people and, and, and they come to my church and they give all they have. It's like, it's like the so-called faith healers who fly in with their private church from the United States, hosted by the, uh, the victory chapels of this world and the winners chapels of this world. And, and they come, I've seen here in Cape Town, how mm -hmm. oh, the young girl brings her grandmother mm -hmm. in a wheelchair to the healing service. He, she goes up, he prays for her, this fellow, and I won't mention his name, who comes from the United States, he prays for her and he tells her, throw away your pills, which she does because she believes God is working at that moment. Our people want God in their lives. I, as a clever, silver-tongued preacher, I exploit that need ruthlessly. And then I tell them, if you believe, if you believe what I have prayed for now, so we make promises God cannot keep. God has not promised this woman that if you throw away your pills, I will heal you. God has told that woman, if you go to the doctor and if you take your medicine, then I will step in and so forth. But, you know, and, 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 and two weeks later, I go and visit this woman in Kailicha. She can't go to the hospital because she has no pills anymore, but she has no more money and she has nothing. She will die because that need was exploited. I don't know what you call this kind of people, but that's what they do. And, and, and so the belief in some leader that they are being told is sent by God. I mean, there is a, there is a reason why so many of our politicians in this country attach themselves to those churches. Um, where their authority as political leader almost immediately gets a divine glow when they are what they call anointed in those churches. And when you get the divine glow, I can guarantee you my vote. Hmm. Elvin, I want to uh, talk to you to shift in some ways a bit of the conversation. Um, now, as you know, in the recent uh, two weeks or so, the United Arab Emirates have officially, uh, I mean, uh, started uh, diplomatic relations with, uh, with uh, Israel. And um, <clears throat> the uh, South African uh, Jewish Board of Deputies and the Zionist Federation have uh, condemned the South African government's statement criticizing uh, this uh, renewal, this uh, starting of uh, formal diplomatic uh, relations. So what you have happening, Ellen, is there is a strand in the ruling party, the African National Congress, that still holds on to earlier memories of how the struggle was waged. And one of the memories that it holds on to is the notion of frontline states. So the ANC seldom took big steps without consulting our allies in the frontline states, 
uh, whether it was with Swapo or whether it was with Kenneth Kahunda or Julius Nereris. I mean, even Tanzania was a part of the frontline state. Of course, the one uh, exception that we had, or later on Samora Machel in Mozambique, the one exception that we had was Kamuzu Banda from Malawi. Malawi, um, Malawi yeah. Who was a complete sellout. The yeah. only, uh, the only Southern African, uh, or perhaps the only African country that had formal diplomatic relations with uh, South Africa was That's Malawi. Right. So yeah. South Africa was uh, surrounded by a group of countries that were quite rightly called the frontline states, as yeah. in the frontline in the struggle against apartheid. And it was a right of the ANC to consult those states before it made big moves because they were truly in solidarity with us. But there's now another kind of logic that goes on in certain circles in the South African government, in the Department of International Relations and Cooperation, in segments of uh, the, uh, the ANC's international uh, people or the government's international people that employs that same logic and says, well, <clears throat> Um, the Arab states are doing this. Uh, we can't out-Arab the Arab states. Uh, let's yeah. wait and consult with the, and of course the, they don't say frontline states, but the logic is the same logic that we used in the apartheid era. Let's see. I mean, look, you know, if uh, the biggest country next to Israel, it's Egypt, has diplomatic relations, if more and more of the Arab countries um, that haven't sold out yet are selling out um, and, and they are becoming caricatures of Kamuzu Banda, the president of Malawi, um, <clears throat> what do we say about who you guys are in South Africa? Who are you to be out Arabing the Arab states? in their relations with Israel, when they are doing this, why should South Africa, not only, of course, I mean, the Palestinians are very grateful for the things that we do, but we who are South Africans know jolly well that South Africa ought to be doing much more in terms of our history. I mean, they're looking, they're looking at the situation in terms of the isolation in the political world and are therefore grateful for uh, what comes from South Africa. But we, who are veterans of the liberation struggle in this country, we know very well that South Africa is doing far, far from what is required and far, far from what is enough. So yeah. what do you say about this kind of logic that I outlined to people in South Africa? Thank you for that question. It's a distorted logic. Um, let me just begin by saying, don't ever forget that Kamuza Banda, before he was president in Malawi, was an elder in the Dutch Reformed Church's mission church in Malawi. So don't forget that. And so that connection with South Africa and the submission to South Africa and the bonds with South Africa through the Africana regime and the Africana church has a long history. That's number one. And, and, and even in those days, the ANC all was clear, we're not following Kamuza Banda because he's thinking, his logic, his commitments, his way of doing politics, not the same as ours. And so we cannot be in the camp with him. We have with, with, with people like Samora Michel and, and Kaunda, we had shared commitments, we had shared principles, we had a shared vision, uh, same understanding of what freedom and liberation and justice and so forth mean. Um, so, and I would have thought that the ANC today would be clear enough in his own mind to know that situations change. And clearly 
the leaders of these African countries are not the same in every case as the leaders that they had in the 1960s and 70s and 1980s, for instance. Um, and so you don't base your foreign policy that you try to develop with other African countries on personalities or just with the idea that this is an African country, you always ask the question, does this African leader share my commitment to freedom and to justice and to equality? And if they don't, then I cannot see why on earth the ANC would take its own principles of justice and freedom and, com and commitment to those things and throw them out the window in solidarity with tin pot dictators who try to run after Donald Trump because they want money from the IMF. Because that's what it comes down to. And because they, the, the United States have put them under pressure and now they invite Netanyahu to come and they have relations with, with, with Israel. So, and that's why if the Arabs, which Arabs, the United Arab Emirates is a dictatorship. Um, the same is true for Bahrain, uh, which is the other country that jumped. The same is true for Egypt. Egypt has a dictator. Egypt has a guy who is doing the bidding of the imperialist every minute of every day. Why should we take him? as an example to follow. Why should his politics be our politics? We know better. We have standards. We have principles. We have a history. We have values. That's got nothing to do with dictatorship. Because if the ANC goes this way, what is to stop the ANC from saying, well, a dictator is ruling in Egypt. Why, why can't we do this here? And if the ANC follows the pressure of the Jewish Board of Deputies, who is already supporting the dictator Netanyahu and the tyrant Netanyahu and the genocide in Netanyahu, why should we be pushed in that direction as a people? And here is where the ANC must be clear. I mean, you are right. We are doing far less than we should have. The fact that there is an Israeli embassy even still in Pretoria is a problem. And we should have taken that issue long ago. So we're not doing what we should be doing. And we're not doing what we can. What is it that stops us from doing that? Who do we owe our loyalties to here, to our people and our principles? internationally to human rights, to decency, to integrity, to honesty, to courage? Or do we owe our policies and our principles to the, some people who are rich enough to give us money and who happen to be supporters of Israel? Those are the questions that we must raise. And those are the issues that we must put on the agenda when we meet our government, if our government is ready to talk to us on these matters and take the kind of decision that is necessary. There is no reason, no reason whatsoever that we should follow the fascists of this world. And that's what you have in the White House and that's what you have in Israel at the moment. Why make a fascist the person to set the standard for your politics? Uh, quite frankly, Ellen, I, I mean, you made a reference to the government or perhaps the ruling party uh, also being recipients of money or donations and feeling beholden to donors in South Africa. I don't know, uh, I, I don't think that that is really a big impulse on, uh, on uh, which way the ANC goes. I think a far bigger uh, this thing is the pressure that the ANC has to face from the United States. Um, because increasingly in relation to many Arab countries and in relation to countries in the Middle East, it's not a particular Zionist lobby inside that country that is trying to influence government agenda. They do try, but uh, they're not nearly as impactful as they are in the United States. But it is the persistent threats of economic punishment, particularly with Trump, that is uh, far more effective in getting government to stand back and wait, let's think three, four, ten times before we make any move against uh, Israel. 
Well, um, yeah. Yeah. So go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So anyway, I mean, I was just that was just my comment, but I wanted to put it to pull in to put in a a last question to you, Ellen. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. okay. So, go Ellen, ahead. Ellen, what would you say are the how do we as um, uh, as South Africans, what is there that we can do to step up both in relation to government, but also in relation to the rest of Africa? Um, <clears throat> what is there that we can do to step up our own solidarity work? Uh, in relation to South Africa, but perhaps more important in relation to the rest of Africa? Well, I, th I think that the African Union, of course, as an African Union, is a natural place for South Africa. But the point is, who is taking the lead and who has the courage to stand up to say in the African Union, these are the principles on which we stand. I keep on coming back to that word. I keep on coming back to the politics of honesty and integrity and decency as, as, as foreign policy matters that I think we try to hold on as far as, 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 as Israel and Palestine is concerned, but we're losing grip. And so advocating for those things as principles is clear. Number two, we can, as a population here, continue to hold our government's hands if what you say is correct. And I still think there's lots of pressure from money inside this country as well, um, but, but, but not to be pressured by the United States. So we need to let our government know in as many ways as we can, how much we support them. Because just remember, Whatever we take for granted leaves a vacuum. And on the other side, nothing is taken for granted. The moment the government says something, there's a board of Jewish deputies, there's a this, there's a that, there's the church, there's the Mohwengs who jump in to put pressure on the government. And we must not let go of government's hand when they are on the right path as far as that is concerned. But we are not called only to hold their hands, we are called also to hold their feet to the fire. And so we must say to government, whilst a declaration of solidarity is good, a policy of BDS is better. Um, it's, it's, it's where we have to go because that's where it stands. And I don't know why South Africans don't understand that because without that BDS component, an international pressure, the apartheid government would never have given in as quickly as they had towards the last 10 years, uh, say from 1980 to 1989. And so for me, it is clear, it's, it's, it, it, these are workable policies, but these are also principled policies. And that is what we must do. And we can come together and find out more ways in which we can put pressure and in which we can set standards, but South Africa has to be a much more activist government in Africa. And we can't sit and be the chairperson of the AU for a year. And at the end of the year, there is really nothing concrete that we have contributed to making Africa a better place and a better leader in terms of politics in the world. Uh, Ellen, uh, thank you very much, but I do want to end with a uh, message that I see on uh, Facebook uh, from the South African Synod of the United Conciliating uh, Church of South Africa. Um, it's, thank you, Dr. Busak, for reminding us that we are a nation of principles. We do not go with the wind wherever the direction, whichever direction it flows. Biblical mandate is very clear when it comes to the issues of human rights, justice for the poor and the marginalized. We dare not disobey God's requirements for justice, mercy, and love learner to be condemned. Money cannot be allowed to replace our moral compass. Thank you, sir.
Thank you very so, much. Uh, Ellen, from all of us on behalf of Africa for Palestine, and I'm sure I speak for the Palestinians also, uh, much gratitude for the availability that you, for the availability for your time, making your time available to us. But above all, uh, Ellen, for your insights and your wisdom and your solidarity. Uh, God bless you and all our other uh, viewers. Take Thank care. You, God, bless, God bless all of you. Thank you. God bless you all, guys. Good night. Good night. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye.